Um, but I wanted to have this conversation because I think all of us are pulling our hair out with all the crazy buyers that we have. And it's just sucking the life out of us, if we're all, to be honest. Um, and so if we're, it's always what we call switch costs. Like we can spend our time energy on the buyers we have, or how do we elevate our listings so we get more listings? And we know if you've had even one listing in your business, it's a huge difference between running a business um, at a higher percentage with listings. So we're going to kind of walk through, I think, the first thing I want you to think of just the mindset of if, what if you were a listing expert? And what I would say by expert is if your business was 60 to 70% sellers. So 60 to 70% sellers. So I know a lot of you that I coach are kind of in that 50, 50 range, which is awesome. But what would it look like and how would you act differently if you could tip the scale and be 10 or 20% higher in this market, right? With inventory the way it is. So I'm not gonna read all the questions, but how do you think that you would act a little different? How do you think you would uh, spend your day a little different? And what skills that maybe you need to work on to improve, right? So I just want you to think about that. And we always talk about be, do, have. Many of you, if you've been at KW, uh, that's something that we've heard a lot. But how do I become a listing expert, do the activities, and then have a consistent abundance of listings? So I want you guys to go into that in this next hour on some, we're going to do some tactical strategies on how we can um, do that, okay? Well, the first thing is we need to make sure that you know the data and you're the local expert. Uh, we talk about that all the time, knowing that market data. A lot of you guys join me for the market of the moment. Some of you don't, which is fine, but we got to know where the puck is going. So make sure you understand you have this dashboard at your fingertips. You're just logging into MLS, you're going into market statistic, and this is a screenshot of what we look at every month on market of the moment. You need to know what this is because difference between a listing agent and a buyer's agent is they really are keeping trends, especially because our MLS areas are so different. We were looking at MLS areas, you know, even different parts of Henrico versus different parts of Chesterfield, you know, 54, 52, dramatically different market data. So make sure if you are going to be choosing to be a listing expert, you have to keep up with those statistics. Uh, so you're organically, fluidly articulating those. Um, so I want to just remind you that that's a foundational piece that should just go on your calendar. Look at update, update weekly, update monthly on what those market data points are. I'm bringing out the old school book. Uh, you guys have seen this probably when you started uh, real estate. Many of us, this was drilled in our heads, but this is not changed. I was actually just watching a webinar with Tom Ferry and uh, Gary Vanderchuk, and they're literally talking about listings are where you have to focus. Yes, the buyers are driving us crazy. We don't have inventory. It's a sad story where they need a house and you can't find them the house. But those that are dwelling on the buyers are going to be left in the dust. And you'll start to see if as you look at market trends and agents and teams that are doing really well in 2021, they focused on the listings. Um, so that's, if you look at it, it starts with the leads at the bottom, listing to the left, leverage to the right. And so you may have heard this, but for every five buyers, you can have 27 active listings, every five buyers. So look at your pipelines and see, are you lopsided? Do you have way more buyers than you do listings? Uh, they're probably sucking more energy and time out of it because you can't leverage them. You can't pawn them off on somebody else to drive them uh, to another showing. You can't pawn them off, you know, in a multiple offer situation, somebody else writing off, right? You're doing the heavy lifting, right? So just want you to kind of consider that as we go into this conversation. So I want to recap some of the lead sources for sellers because I don't know that we're digging deep enough in the well. We're not going back to the well and going, how can we go deeper with some of these? Our database, 48% of seller leads is tracked year after year from the National Association of Realtors. 48% of our seller leads come from our database, 48%. So if you don't have enough listing leads, I would challenge you and I love you all to death. You're not digging deep enough into your database. You're not touching, communicating, and the frequency is not at the level it needs to be. Or you have the wrong people in your database. If they're not giving you what, you, what you're asking for and they're not building a relationship to help you get more listings, 
either asking for the wrong things or you have the wrong people in there. So be careful about that. We also know social media. I would really challenge us to, before you post something, think about does it attract a seller conversation or a buyer conversation? A house under contract does not promote a seller conversation. It's, it needs to be worded differently. It needs to be more tactical strategies on how we're gonna be able to focus on seller conversations. So let's just be honest. Is there, do you think when you're posting something that says, coming soon, is that gonna attract more leads? The house is already gonna sell in five minutes. We know that the market's gonna absorb it pretty quick. Or would it be more productive for you to have social media posts that says things like, how has COVID changed the way you work in your house? What is one thing you love about your house or would change about your house, right? Asking questions on what's changing their world. If sellers, something's changed, that's why they wanna move. Or even if subconsciously they wanna either remodel or do something, right? Open houses, they're almost non-existent. Uh, went to open house with my wife, Kim, the other day. It was just a free for all. It was just thousands of people running through the door. It was basically like a glorified showing, right? Where and the agent was just standing there in the doorway, just making sure everybody was COVID safe. But what if instead of us focusing, yes, we're going to do the open house, but what's that pre-work? What's the seller focused activities we can do? Calling the neighborhood, canvassing the neighborhood, door hangers, not don't have to knock on the door, but adding door hangers to people's doors, uh, grabbing email lists, be, emailing your database that you're having an open house. I know that they don't live in a house, but they need to show different things. Circle prospecting. I just got off a, a call with a client today. She circle prospected a listing that she had. She called the neighborhood and literally was simple and said, I just sold a listing down in your neighborhood and I'm, I have tons of buyers. I'm looking for for more sellers. She got two listing appointments. She's going on one in an hour right now. All because she logged into Mojo, which is free to you guys, throw the address in there and did some circle prospecting. And I asked her, I said, what were some of the objections you heard? What were people, were they grumpy on the phone? She's like, no, absolutely not. She said, I literally, the worst case I had was, no, I'm not interested. And then the best case, they're like, yeah, I heard the market. There's a lot of people that, there's a lot of buyers looking to, to buy houses. So go back to some of that um, things. Past clients, this one we'll talk about a little bit further. You need to go back through your database three to five years, if not longer, if you've been in the business 10 years, do it. If you have a team, divide and conquer. You guys need to go through your past client database and start working on do they, is it now the time for them to sell or is it for them to time to refinance? And then business to business and for sale by owners and expireds and farming. We've seen this list hundreds of times. If you've been to any training throughout your career, you've seen this list, but I will tell you is if you're picking two or three of them on this list, are you executing it at a high level? I would say right now our buyers are pulling at our pant leg and we're chasing our buyers rather than, than focusing on our listing. So I don't wanna to preach to you guys. I, I know how hard you're working, but we need to go back to some of these foundational things so we can really elevate our listing <clears throat> ability to list more properties, because that's gonna be the name of the game. Other things I've noticed in your pipeline is that maybe we start off a little optimistic. We put a listing lead in our pipeline and we put it as an A when they're not really ready to list in 30 days. Remember, A, B, and C is 30 days is A, B is 60 days. C is within the year. Be very careful about if you haven't pre-qualified them enough, those need to be ranked correctly. Because I'm looking at your A's. We want to see a huge pipeline quality of your pipeline has to start with a large amount of A's. And I know that's hard to get. So when I see somebody have six, seven, eight A's on their pipeline and they're not under contract with a buyer or a seller in 30 days, we need to be just more aware of that. And so how do we qualify that? I want you to make sure you re recognize that seller mo motivation, that to be ready to sell, that to be willing to do whatever they need to do to get the house sold, and they gotta be able. Like those three things are three different things. Yes, they wanna take advantage of the market because they're ready to make 50,000 in profit. 
but are they willing to do the things to the house or willing to step up and list it now? And are they able to sell and possibly rent for a year or live in someone's basement? Like they've got to be able to have all three together. Every one of us would say we're ready to sell our house if we're going to make 50, 60,000, but are we willing to do the activities and get and able to do it financially, right? So we just got to really be um, inspect our pipelines a lot better. I will say the first 60 days of, of 2021, it was all about just getting our pipeline deep and seeing how many we have in there, which I'm proud of you guys are great. But now it's turning it up a notch and making sure it's that quality control. I want to see if it's a relay. And don't, you know, don't sugarcoat it. If you only have one or two A's, at least we know what we're working with rather than this kind of living in a mirage of uh, what we think is going to happen. And also make sure you're using some type of lead catching form. We use um, a seller Google questionnaire. If you want this, I can send it to you. But a lot of times we're not asking enough questions for sellers right now because we're moving so fast and they're like, yeah, just get it on the market. You know, we'll sell it as it was we'll stick its eye on the yard. I understand the method to it, but there's a lot of things in this questionnaire to get, dig deeper into what they're willing their willing, able, and ready status really is. So use the seller questionnaire. Um, I'm happy to send this to you. It's already pre-done. And remember, this is what they what they get. And then you can evaluate this. This should go to them before you go on the appointment, right? So if you're going to meet them at their house tomorrow at three o'clock, make sure you're sending an email that says, absolutely look forward to seeing you tomorrow at three, but fill out this form ahead of time. Because a lot of these questions you either forget to ask or you get caught up in conversation and you don't get deep enough into the conversation uh, to ask these kind of questions. So I wanna make sure you go through that. All right, so we buzzed through that. This is the heart of it. I wanna make sure that we have, when we're elevating our listings, we have a unique value proposition options. Um, does anybody know what TOM stands for? Does anybody know? I'm curious if you know. I'll answer it. Oops, I thought I was gonna do that. Um, it stands for top of mind. So some of the things I want you guys to be aware of is that we got to stay in these three core habits. I was just looking again, we were, I was on a conference this morning, 2021, crazy as it may be, but email marketing and direct mail marketing are still one of the top three ways to keep top of mind. So large high volume teams and large production brokerages across the United States, literally in the middle of a pandemic, email marketing and direct mail marketing is the most effective, not to be overtopped by relationship building habits. So I've, I coached you guys one-on-one -on -one and asked you like, what are your core daily habits? I would challenge you that the three habits need to include one of these, all three of these. Relationship building habits could be examples of obviously phone calls, text messages, private messages, handwritten notes, hot buys if that's your thing, right? Those are relationship building habits. But email marketing, if you're not sending at least, and they're actually saying doing one a week, seems extreme to me, but if you're not at least doing one email marketing campaign to your database once a month, you're missing the opportunity of being top of mind. Is it a newsletter? Is it updating them on what the market is? Is it asking them, do you want a free CMA? Is it, again, make sure email marketing, it's focused on seller-based questions, not buyer-based questions, right? But what emails do you have? And then direct mail, are you mailing to your database? Are you uh, above and beyond your business card? I mean, uh, your handwritten note with a business card, what are you putting out there? And then of course, those of you that farm, you know the reap the benefits of that, but that may be time to double down and do a second farm. Um, what they were, were basically seeing trend-wise is that these three things you gotta do more of. You have to build more relationships, which we know, it's kind of building and cultivating your database we've heard forever. But that email marketing, if you're, is different than your database. So email marketing are just, are people that you just constantly are adding to that. I personally use constant contact as an email marketing resource, and then I have a da my database is separate. But my email marketing has over 3,000 people in it. That's still not enough. They're saying like four to 5,000 people. 
So think about vendor relationships, past clients, past coworkers, PTA. Of course, make sure you get permission to use them. But I would say you need to make sure if you're thinking about how do I stay top of mind, these core three things have to be part of it, okay? I'm happy to talk to you kind of one-on-one -on -one what that is. Another thing that we need to really kind of make sure for unique value at social media is that we really need to engage or create our own Facebook groups. I know I'm a, a member of like a thousand different Facebook, Facebook groups myself, but you gotta be make a point to interact and make sure you contribute, not sell, right? But the cool thing is if you personally created your own Facebook page, whether it's a fan page, vendor, recreation, local, anything, you're throwing a party every day, right? You could hop on there and depending on how large you grow that, that Facebook group, you could be interacting with 30, 40, 150 people a day. That is way faster than texting, calling, emailing those people. And they can then go hop on there and look at it whenever they want to, right? You can also share it, put that in an email newsletter. Hey, did you catch the latest XYZ on the Facebook group, right? I know we're all, if you're not going to create your own Facebook group, you got to get involved in the ones that you are in, right? So really make sure you make a point to do that, especially the neighborhood Facebook pages. If you know a good vendor, post on there. Like say, hey, I just got my carpets cleaned. Use this guy, right? Interact. Those are, again, that's that local business. And I want to make sure you guys are just really tapping into that. Another trend we're seeing is video is king. I've been saying that for, I swear, for three years. But we've got to start realizing that, especially with COVID, video has come way up the ranks. The newest statistic they just came out literally a couple of weeks ago, so 81% of consumers prefer to watch a video to learn before they decide to buy or select the service. So what would it look like if you did one, if you did a personal 30 second video text message that said, hey, Catherine, I hope you're having a great day. I was thinking about you today. And in fact, I know you purchased last year at this time and I sent you a, a CMA and I wanted to make sure it didn't go into your spam. So just make sure, text me back and make sure you got that CMA uh, or if I need to send it to a different email address, let me know, right? What if we did those type of text messages where it was number one, a face-to-face -face communication and it's alerting them to that you're sending them an email, right? It's, it's something of value there, right? Facebook and Instagram Live, you can see tons of people are doing that. So it, I see we wane with that. Sometimes we like get excited about it, and then sometimes we, we don't feel like we have content. It's the consistency piece for that. So I want you to guys to challenge you to, you know, if you're going to truly elevate your listing, they need to see you uh, on all kinds of platforms, and video is the way to do it, okay? Um, and I'm up to, what do I do? Two Facebook Lives a week. I do all kinds of things. I don't love it, but I know that's just how to build my brand and how to build awareness. Uh, so you, you gotta do what you gotta do, even if you're an introverted extrovert like me. All right, whoops. Every listing should attract two seller leads. That needs to be resonating every time you put a for sale sign in the yard. You need to squeeze enough lemon juice out of that to get two more leads. If you did not get two additional seller leads, seller leads, not buyer leads, you didn't do enough. And I, I know you're working hard again. I know you're working as efficiently as you can, but really dissect how can I get two additional seller leads? What am I saying? What am I posting? What do my postcards say? What are my conversations for sign calls? What are they, right? Our goal, we know the listing is going to sell anyway. Our goal is to get more listings because we know that that's what we need to be able to control with that listing leads leverage. So I want you to think about that. I want you to look at that on your pipeline. Identify it. If you get a lead from a listing, put that on your pipeline. The lead source is past listing of one, two, three, Smith Street. I want to start to see tracking. Are we getting that two for one ratio? Hell, if we could get one for one ratio, if we get a listing and we get one additional seller lead, we'd probably take that, right? So really focus on tracking that information. Even if it sells in two hours, do everything you normally do, right? Still send it out to your data. They still put it in. Um, you can even still postcards out, right? Who cares that it's two weeks old? It's still a touch. It's still a way to do it. Make sure you're doing things on social media, like guess the price 
sneak peek, do a little tour of the property in, the, in doing anything you can. And again, I mentioned prospecting, uh, circle prospecting right. Hey, I have a new listing. Yes, you have 16 offers on, on the table. Well, they're not ratified yet. Still make the phone call. Hey, I have a new listing, right? Don't hesitate. Make sure you push through. A lot of the data, especially Zillow and stuff, that stuff is 24 to 40 hours behind. So as long as you are kind of ahead of the ball, I want you to think through that. Also, I've been seeing people pulling some of the services away when they're listing. We can't do that. We're absence of value is a discussion of price. We are listing properties, but there's, there's a lot of force by owners going on, right? And we gotta realize we're charging a commission, so we can't pull the staging and pull the photography. I see listings out there where they're not staging and they're not using professional photography when they used to. I understand things are gonna sell fast, but part of that value that you're bringing to the seller is that they're marketed at a Nordstrom level quality uh, marketing plan, not a TJ Maxx, right? We're not doing it with our iPhone. We have two vendors in our organization that we support. Ann Pershing is amazing if you haven't used her. And Rachel Hines, she's great with uh, Richmond Real Estate Photography. Um, they And they do some incredible work. So I just want to make sure I also hear like, I'm going to cut some costs. Well, you got to be careful because your reputation, a lot of that stuff is connected again through social media and people are looking at, was it staged? What does it look like? And yes, the house is selling in five minutes, but because you're, you're kind of cheaping out on the front end, you're not going to get another listing, right? So again, how do we get two for one? We've got to still do all the activities that we normally do, even though we know in the back of our head that it's going to sell in two or three days. I want to make sure you guys are using multiple offer forms. This is a Google form that we've created. If you want access to it, I can give it to you. Sellers get overwhelmed when they get 10 offers. How we get overwhelmed when we have 10 offers, right? Putting this in a spreadsheet where they can see and compare apples to apples and ranking them the way that you think they should be. Maybe, you know, offer one, but you think offer one and offer four are the best. You know, make sure you're using that because they've got to realize what that is. Also understand that as is addendum doesn't mean it's like they're locked into the deal. I don't know why we think that. It has a 10 day and the purchaser may terminate the purchase agreement. And as is addendum does not mean that the buyer is locked into this house. So when we're accepting offers for our seller and we're like, yeah, it's as is, it's, it's a good offer. If they're using it as is addendum, you know, you're gonna need to strike through that section of that addendum or not use that type of addendum. Use just language in the other term section instead. Otherwise, also escalations, we're not seeing that they're working. So a lot of a lot of situations we're abandoning the escalation or just going in at highest and best, and it's going crazy. I had one that was $83,000 yesterday, did not get the offer. Lost it, $83,000, right? So you have to have all these conversations to kind of be aware uh, and make sure you're telling your sellers that as well. And then this is some of the things I want you to really kind of hone into, like how do we elevate? We've got to go get foundational and make sure you're going back to your database. We've talked about like DTD2, right? Doing those two conversations or two letters a week. But we've got to make sure we're getting through our entire database once a quarter, right? 13 weeks, right? So we've got to be really diligent about that. Um, and when you're all running around trying to get the buyers on the I know that's a challenge, but there's a system to it. I'm gonna, if you remember, like this is, the, this is the system, right? Week one, we're right now, we're in the second week of, the, of this new quarter, right? F and D, print this. If you get behind, you can know, at least know where you we were behind and catch back up. We've gotta get those connections um, through there. Also, I don't know if some of you have built that fan VIP page, which I talked about before. Groups are really working for a lot of people across the country. So if you don't have a VIP fan page for your, for your um, business, create one. If not, you're gonna need to really tag into some other groups, mom groups, soccer groups, uh, I don't care, any other groups that you have like-minded people connect with. I would like to talk about these client events. I, I understand and respect we have to get through a transition with COVID, we have to do client events. 
our business is a relationship business. We are in the human business. We've got to figure out a way to where we can be somewhat six feet apart, belly to belly in a relationship with someone. So I really want you to think about client events, doing a drive-by event where you're giving away cookies, you're giving away pies, you're giving away Mother's Day flowers. You've got to come up with a plan, right? And it doesn't have to be 100 people. It could be an hour and 20 people show up, right? And you don't have to get out of the car and you can be masked up. But we've got to get really connected with these client events because the people are coming. Literally, you see more people at, at the park and more people at, at Target because people are getting more comfortable because of vaccinations. And we don't want to be behind the herd curve. We don't want to plan an event on third quarter when you need to be planning it in April, May, June. We need to come up with something that's safe for you, but it's effective for your client events. I did see a little, um, yeah. So what are people doing in their uh, VIP programs? So if we're talking about the closed Facebook groups, we're talking about giveaways, you're gonna talk about upcoming listings, like guess the price. You're gonna talk about before and afters, what are you guys doing? Like do something about like they've lived in the house that says, what renovations have you done? I know, and then post a picture, right? A lot of your VIP people have lived in their house two or three years. So if they've painted a room, remodeled a kitchen, have them post that in there. Everybody that has renovated a portion of their house, post a photo in the VIP page. I'll do a raffle at the end, right? And of course, then you're gonna comment and say how amazing the kitchen turned out or who did you use for the cabinets or who did you use for painters? I'm always looking for good vendors. So I would say top VIP fan pages, guess the price and current listings. What have you done to remodel your house since, since we've sold that property with you? Uh, and then the third is just kind of doing random raffles of, of things, especially like Google reviews. It was interesting. I was talking to Tom Ferry to said, he's saying, stop doing Zillow reviews and you have to do Google reviews. He predicts that with all the Facebook regulations that Facebook is, is not the kind of the, the one that we should go after, but Google is the strongest. And he gave a challenging testament. He said, what if you, made that one of your daily habits is to get Google reviews from your past clients. I've been kind of coaching to that over the last 30 days. They tell the story, you don't. You can use that for social media as testimonial um, information. But Google is running a lot of algorithms and the more Google reviews you can do, the better. So it was interesting, he was talking about that you should focus on Google reviews, not Zillow and not Facebook reviews, which um, is interesting there. So maybe that can go in your fan page where you're trying to really increase your Google reviews, posting those and things like that. Um, gratitude gifts. I would rather you guys, uh, we are a huge Richmond Cheese Buffini based, um, they call them obviously pot pies. I would rather you focus on quality of them. Maybe you're not doing them every month. Maybe you're doing them once a quarter and you give better quality gifts, right? I don't know that the two, three, four dollar gift is kind of is that trend is is moving, right? We're seeing people spending ten dollars a gift, but they're not doing it every month. So maybe they're doing four quality gifts a year, right? And they're calling it a VIP or a gratitude gift. So maybe you look at your situation, whether it's financial or your time. Maybe you don't do Popeyes every month. Maybe you do a really nice gift once a quarter, or you do every other month. Just something to consider. I've seen a lot of people transitioning uh, to a higher quality gift and not as much quantity and not as much frequency on that. And then we talked about monthly quarters and newsletters. So, and this was something I wanted you guys to be aware of, like the success rate of selling to a customer you already have is 60 to 70%, while new customers is five to 20%. If you look on the right side of my screen, 70% or on the high side is 20%. I would challenge you guys to, instead of being the hunter, be the nurturer. Instead of being the hunter, be the nurturer. And really focus on that. And sometimes I think we're fo so focused on the hunt. Um, number one, that stresses us out. But we have our gold in our database. And now is the time to do that. Especially going into second quarter, kind of heading into this, the latter part of the year, okay? Talked about this. I can, again, send this to you. We send this to you once a month, but print this off. Use these two letters as a simple way to go on Facebook, to text message your database uh, and work your way through.
this is the gold nugget right here. We need to be reaching out to our database by using this one conversation alone. Uh, literally, I've had, in our coaching room, we've had three listings this month just by a few people starting this method. We are in the financial, re we are, our job and our responsibility is to be the financial resource for them, right? And it's not just one and done. We need to do a wealth checkup every year, just like you do a health checkup every year, just like if you are dealing with a financial planner, they do an analysis on your portfolio. If we sold a buyer a house two years ago, we should be doing from this point forward every year an evaluation on that house for them. A quick CMA, very simple, not in the weeds, 15 to 20 minutes, and send that to them every single year. It'd be great if you could calendar it to where it's the anniversary month that they purchased, right? So two years ago, they purchased in April. You send an email that says, happy home anniversary. I can't believe it's been two years since you've lived in the, you closed on your property. I wanted to give you a wealth financial checkup. And here is what your current value is without doing a lot of research, meaning I don't know all the upgrades you've done and we can go a little bit more uh, in depth with some of the uh, modifications and updates in the market. But I can already see that you can make $30,000 just in two, two years if you decided to sell now. But also I want you to say refinancing resources. If there's, in addition to that email, I would like for you to be able to say, if you're not wanting to sell now, it may be an opportunity even two years later to refinance. Rates are incredibly low. You may think, well, why would I tell them to refinance? Because the goal and the authentic self is to be that wealth resource. If they, it's not, it doesn't make financial sense for them to sell and it makes more sense to refinance, they're gonna thank you later with referrals and, and obviously your lender partners are gonna love that because they can get that refinance business. But if I were saying, hey, I don't have that 60 to 70% listing ratio and I, want, I desire to do that, I would go into my database and work on that. A few a week, not do the whole database in a day, but if you did five or 10 of those CMAs, quick CMAs, and send an email to them, what would that look like, right? I will tell you that you need to follow up with that text video, right? So it's, hey, this is Drew. I just wanna let you know I sent you this. This CMA it was a very quick CMA, but it is a two-year update on your wealth checkup to see you know, how you're doing with the equity of your home. I'd love to chat with you a little bit more about it. If you've done any improvements, we can adjust it to see if it's gone up in any way. Um, and I also just wanna make sure it didn't hit your junk mail. Text me back and make sure you got that, that CMA that I sent you, right? Those videos connected with that email. So if you're not getting those quick responses with email, do a quick text video, okay? But I would love to be able to see this happen. And I hate that the low inventory is causes. This is something we should be doing anyways. Even if our inventory was at a normal level and we had a normal uh, kind of even market, we are the wealth experts. We're helping them build financial wealth, right? And we need to be constantly evaluating uh, annually on what their checkup is. And if you can get any information, you should also update them with their seller net sheet, right? If they do reply, say, I can get you real specific on what, do you know how much your loan payment is or loan payoff is? Some people do. Some people don't even pay attention. Some people do. You could do another follow-up even with a seller net sheet. So really want you to dive into that. Other things is we got to make sure if you want to do some automated, this is a magazine. I don't know if anybody um, subscribes to this. I love this. Um, it's a media uh, reminder media they have this American lifestyle one they have a fitness one but it has your information branded on it um, we we see a lot of people getting value out of it it's, it stays on the shelf but the good thing is, is if you send it to 40 or 50 it'll automatically mail them for you you don't have to think about it or if you want that hands-on approach you can do a monthly customized newsletter in Canva or whatnot right but something still needs to hit their mailbox monthly, quarterly at the minimum, but monthly would be the best preferred there. Um, and I always, I'm gonna end with this so we can have a little quick discussion on what you think some other strategies. Ideas are shit, except execution is the game, right? So make sure like 
if you're looking at, I want to elevate my listing, I've got to identify one thing that I can execute and be more of an expert on. And like I said, stop being the hunter, focus on the nurtures. Like there's all your money, all the gold, all of the listings are in your database. Either your database has to get better quality or you have to lean into it and use it at a higher level. So I'm going to stop talking for a few minutes. I wanted to get feedback from you guys on what are you seeing are the obstacles of, of you not getting, taking on more listings? Are any comments about what we just covered? I can go back, I can move the slides around. I wanna make sure you get some nuggets out of that. Anything? Has anybody had any success um, in doing any strategies to attract listings that they wanna share? Are we all just stuck in buyer hell? Is what I call it, yeah. Um, let me see what else. <laughs> buyer hell, <laughs> Jennifer. Um, yeah, we're all kind of in buyer hell. And I think that's the problem is they are, I was talking to another coach client today. She's physically exhausted by her buyers. Like she's got five of them and I think they're literally sucking the life out of her. And it's finding that time or creating that space to where we've, we've got to focus on sellers. And I think we are this servant leader, so we want to help the buyers and they're, but we can't build physical houses. We have to find more, you know? And so the way we can control it is by listing. So I would just say if you're not lead generating for listings and you're spending all the time with the buyers, it's going to be a really short window before your pipeline dries up. And unfortunately, you don't have the momentum that you built in first quarter. So. Well, I would challenge you guys to go back to one of the slides I was telling, challenging you with. Let me go back a few. When I went to the, the slide of the three things, which is the, ironically, is the email and is the direct mail and the business to business. Oh, it's way further back. Is those five core habits. Like, do you know what your five core habits are? Um, trying to find them. Where are they? Are. So if you can identify what your five core habits are, and what I mean by that is don't do a lot of high intense things, right? So think about it in the gym mentality. If I said, hey, you need to pick up a 250 pound weight, you probably could real, you know, get enough musts and to like lift it, but could you do it every day? Rather than what I'd like for you to do, I don't know where the slide is, is that you focus on five habits. So one of my clients, uh, they were like, I'll do one handwritten note a day. I'll do one Facebook post a day. I'll call one person in my data, or one do one video text message a day through my database. I'll do one CMA a day to a past client, and I'll do one, um, one, uh, I have a buyer letter is what he was, he was going to do. So those are his five core things and he's doing one of each one. So when your day goes to hell, at least you got all five of those things on and you physically can cross them off. I don't know where I put that. Um, so I want you to think about that. Like what would be your five core habits? And I'd like for you to, um, oh, that's what it is. I'd like you to think about like what, what those are, but I'd like to know as your coach. Like I know if there's a few of you that have texted me or emailed me yours, but what are your four, five core habits? And again, it needs to be lead generation based specifically for sellers, right? Activities that you can do, what are the five things? Again, it should be relationship based habits, email and direct mail should be connected in there somehow, okay? So I want you to just go into the rest of this week and think about like how can we get ahead of the curve. Um, I think we're in a really weird, precarious time, especially in second quarter. If we're not careful and we're focusing all on our buyers, we're gonna look up in August, September, October, third, the end of third quarter, and we're not gonna have the healthy business that we think we have. Because the buyers are either gonna give up or the buyers were gonna get under contract. And then what are we gonna have left over? So, when you're tired and you're and you're worn out, and I totally know you are, because I talk to you guys every day, 
but we have to shift our time and shift our focus into elevating listing opportunities rather than elevating buyers. No offense, I love a, I love a buyer, but they are not the longevity of, a, of, um, of real estate. And so I just want you to think about that. Again, going back to that core principle, right? Listing leads leverage. We're off with these slides today. I have a question. That net sheet um, that you had on the screen was the one from Title Alliance. Um, and that was my most favorite net sheet. It is not available anymore. Does, it, does anybody have a good net sheet? I thought that one was really simple. It was easy to understand. It was easy for me to do. Um, the one uh, in, in the MLS, I think, is terrible. Yeah, does anybody have one? Because I was playing around with the Title Alliance one. Um, I'm sure other title companies have one. I know. Um, so I would say reach out to another, if you've used one or two more title companies, see if they have one. Um, but does anybody have one that they use? Um, I was working with someone that uses cloud CMA. Yeah. So AW kind of endorses toolkit CMA. I like cloud CMA better because it's, it looks better and you can import your logo. It looks just a little bit cleaner. And it has a great seller net sheet. So uh, maybe I'll try that. Using, I mean, I think Cloud CMA or Toolkit CMA, they technically do have a seller net sheet option in that program. Okay, I'll check that out. Um, so, anything else? What are you guys thinking um, about the market? We have a few minutes before we end. Like, do you, do you find, I mean, you're finding it frustrating, but what are you finding that? The listings you've gotten in the last 60 days, what, how did you get them? What are you doing to, to kind of leverage that to get more listings off of them? Anybody have any good stories to share? Because I know you guys have listed properties because I see them. Is it coming from your database? Is it coming from direct mail? Is it coming from vendors? Because that's what we're seeing, at least as far as what we're tracking. So I want you to think about that, just where you lean into those, those resources. And you're probably gonna have to do more than what you've used to do. I mean, if you did four conversations a day, you'll have to go up to eight. And I know that's like, where do you find the time? Um, but that's the name of the game on a lot of that. So the other thing is that I would tell you is that and some of you are on teams, some of you are not. Teams are starting to take over a lot of space in our industry. We're seeing teams become very large in Richmond, but we're also seeing teams, real estate teams, becoming very large and as an industry as a whole. I mean, we're seeing teams that are expansion teams that are selling 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 houses. That's as much as one entire brokerage, right? And they're a team. So if you're a solo agent, I would be thinking to myself, teams are getting the listings because of sheer volume and sheer the branding that they're doing and the money that they're spending. They're spending money on a lot of direct mail and they're spending money on a lot of email marketing and they're spending a lot of money on social media marketing, right? So how do you, how do you defend your own territory as a solo agent? And if you are a team and you're not getting that level of result that you desire, Lean into those other teams. What are they doing that you guys are not doing? And that's some of the things that I want to challenge all of us. But teams are really growing quickly. I see team. I mean, they look, I used to joke, I will mention the team name, um, but he had a football team and they all look like Barbie dolls. And I, that's fine. But now everybody is, looks like a football team. I mean, 10, 12, 14 people on a team is not abnormal in real estate teams now. But I will tell you less than two years ago, a normal team was two to three people. So it's, that's affecting listing inventory. Listing inventory is being, is being um, absorbed by large teams. I print off the top 100 every single month on um, closed production. And last week I was going through, out of 100 people, the top performings in Richmond's market, it was 47 of them actually are teams. They're under one person in the MLS ID number, but there are 47 of them are teams. So almost half of the highest producing agents are teams. Think about that. So I just want you to, 
to go through that. Are you properly leveraged? Do you have admin help? Do you have marketing help? Are, what do you have versus your competition? And you know, I hate comparing one to another, so I don't think that's a fair game, but there's something to be said where they're, they're leveraging things out. And that's how listings are being created. So I want you to just think about that. Look at some other of your competitors, maybe not even in this market. Look at, you know, go to the West Coast. You'll notice teams are becoming a very dominant player in the real estate space. Okay. So I'd love for, to kind of talk to you guys offline, one-on-one -on -one at your one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions. But I want you to think about going into the next, you know, the second quarter. How do we elevate our listings more? How do we increase our skills? And how do we attract more listings? All right, guys. Well, that's everything for today. I hope to see your smiling faces soon. Hey, I just did, we're planning a outdoor event where we actually physically can see you. I, we're getting ready to book it now. You can have 30 people in one space, socially distanced outside. So we're working on a, a like outdoor client appreciation party for you guys. So I'm excited once we get all the developments of that. Cause I miss seeing your face. I, I like Zoom, but I really miss seeing you guys. So. Look out for that uh, RSVP invite once we get the details worked out. Denise is working on that for us. All right, well, have a great rest of your day, and I will send this recording out if you want to review that, and I'll send out the slides. But uh, it's all about execution. Find one thing you can do to elevate your listings, okay? Goodbye, guys. Have a great day, and I'll talk to you guys soon.